Hello, I'm Kate Cunningham, author of the Vlad Flea history books. And here's Vlad Flea. We've joined you today to talk about the houses in 1666 as part of the Wandsworth Heritage Festival. We're going to use Sam's illustrations to tell you all about what houses were like in the time of King Charles II. So to do that, we need to hop back to the future back to 2021. Hello, so here we are back in 2021 and uh, I, I seem to have got bitten back in 1666. I'm, I'm sure it won't be serious. The other thing is I've lost Vlad and I'm not entirely sure where he's gone. So if you could, um, if you could just check under your chair and make sure he hasn't decided to go and hide in your room, that would be great. So, we're going to take a look now inside our houses and compare our house now and the houses back in 1666. Now many of those houses would have been built in Tudor times, in the time of maybe back for Henry VIII but certainly Elizabeth I and they were still standing and still being used. Here we've got our modern house and actually this bit at the top here looks quite similar to houses during the Great Fire of London. Here we've got the picture at the front of the book and these houses here, the material that they're made out of, looks quite similar to this. But it is different material. We often call this on modern houses mock Tudor because it's made out of plaster. It's made out of a different material. The material that would have been used back in 1666 was big wooden timbers dipped in tar to preserve them and make sure they didn't get rotten and in between this bit in between them was called wattle and daub and wattle and daub was a mixture of smaller sticks that had been woven together covered in a material called daub that was the wattle bit this is the daub bit if you were going to make a recipe for daub it would be a bit of mud a bit of straw and some horse poo mixed in with it. You'd mix it all together and then you'd spread it over the top of the sticks, wait until it had dried and then paint it. So that was wattle and daub. This roof is made out of straw. It's a thatched roof and we have tiled roofs now. In theory, the roofs in 1666 should have been tiled as well. It had become a law that you had to have tiled roofs. But I think the reality, personally, I think the reality would be that there'd still be quite a lot of thatched roofs because people can't afford to just rip your roof off and replace it. It's an expensive thing to have to do. So you might have a thatched roof. You would definitely have a building made out of wattle and daub. Your windows would have been smaller, made out of much smaller pieces of glass. And now we have our tiles. This would be plaster now and much bigger windows. The other difference on the outside of our house is if we want to go somewhere, we might go in the car. Parents might drive us or our adult might drive us somewhere. We might get a bus, we might get a train. There are lots of options. You could get up on a bicycle and cycle somewhere. But back in 1666, if you wanted to go somewhere, you either walked or you would need the help of a horse in a horse and carriage. So this house obviously is a bit more wealthy because they've got their own horse next to the house. So we're going to go inside the house now and think a little bit more about the differences inside of our house. I mentioned before that you can print off your own versions of this and make make copy of this. I've done a large version so that we can have a good look at it, an A3 version. The version on the computer is A4. I will show you about that a little bit later on. But for now I'm going to show you inside this this copy, this slightly larger copy of it. 
the first thing we're going to talk about is that in 1666 there was no electricity. So now if it gets a little bit darker in the evening or you want to play a game you can just plug it in or switch the light on. You wouldn't be able to do that in 1666. Anything that needs a plug to be plugged in to the wall or needs a battery to work didn't exist. There was no electricity and all the things that use electricity had not been invented. So in our pictures here we've got a light shade, light hanging from the ceiling, we've got a lamp up in this room here. What do you think they're going to be using when it gets dark? They're just going to walk around in the dark. What could we use? Well they're going to all be using candles. This one is a big arrangement hanging from the ceiling. You could unhook and pull down the light and then pull back up again. Up in the bedroom here they've got candlesticks and four candles. Four candles? Candles were quite expensive so if you wanted four going there was a really important reason why you wanted a lot of light. And they probably would also be much more smoky and smell not very nice. They wouldn't smell like apples or cinnamon or gingerbread like they often do now. They would have smelt of animal fat because that's what a lot of them were made from. We know a lot about things that happened in 1666 because of a man called Samuel Pepys who wrote a diary. And he actually stopped writing his diary 10 years after he began because he became worried about the effects of writing by candlelight and it was hurting his eyes. He thought that he was going to lose his sight completely if he carried on writing a diary every night by candlelight. So it was a much darker place back in 1666 at night. As you can see in these rooms, they are an awful lot darker. Now the other thing that uses electricity downstairs in this room are our TV and our radio. Also, if you were thinking, oh, I would always keep my games console near me, you wouldn't be able to have a games console no, no um, computer games or laptops. If you wanted entertainment in the evening, you couldn't just go into your living room and turn the TV on. You would have to make your own entertainment. So some families would have pianos, they'd have other smaller instruments. And in the evening, perhaps if you wanted to spend some time relaxing, you would play yourself some music or one of the family would play some music, sing some songs, um, perhaps read a book if you can read by the candlelight. And of course we play music and read books now. We can, we can do if we want to, but remember that's a choice we have now. Back in 1666 that was no choice. You either made your own entertainment or you had no entertainment unless you were going to go out and go to the theatre or something like that. The last really important thing that we use electricity for that I'm going to point out in this house is to stay warm. So in this picture here we've got a radiator and we need electricity to make our boiler work and maybe if you've got electric heaters make your heaters work. But obviously over 350 years ago you needed to do something else and that would be to light a fire in the fireplace. Every room in the house would have had a fireplace where you could light a fire. And this is the other big reason why there were so many fires around this time. We've talked about the material that the house is made from, that was one of the, one of the reasons. The other reason is there was a lot of fire to set fire to the materials that made your house. So if you had fires and candles and your house was made out of wood and straw, they were a bad combination when it came to 
fires. Often a little spark might fall out of the fire and catch onto something nearby and then the rest of the house might go up in flames too, which is exactly what happened during the Great Fire of London. One last thing in this picture, we've got a hoover here. If you wanted to do your housework, hoover and cleaning, things like that, you'd need to put in a lot more effort and use a broom instead. So, no electricity. What else is missing from our house 350 years ago? The other thing that's missing is in this room up here. We all have a room completely dedicated to washing ourselves and keeping clean and looking after ourselves. This house, wouldn't, this house would not have had a bathroom like this because they had no water and no taps coming straight into the house. A few houses did have one pipe coming through the house, but most people would have to go to the nearest well or perhaps collect water from the river. You might collect river water for washing the floors and doing slightly dirtier jobs, but to drink and wash yourself in, you'd have to go and collect water from the well in a bucket. So you'd have to go and collect it. And then when you got home, if you wanted to wash with it, you probably want to heat it. You'd have to put it over the fire and warm it up. And if you wanted more than just to wash your face and hands, you'd need to do that a few times. I wonder how many of us would really want to wash that often if we had to walk to collect the water and then heat it up and put it in a bath and then heat some more, put it in a bath and keep doing that in a little tin bath maybe. I don't think many of us would be, would really be bothered to do it all that often and some of us might not want to do it at all. So no taps, no, no sink, no bath. There's one more object in this room that we all use every single day and need to use that would not have been in a Tudor house or a Stuart house. And that is a flushing toilet. Flushing toilet hadn't been invented either. It uses quite a lot of water. If you wanted to go to the toilet, we all need to go to the toilet after all, but if you wanted to go in the middle of the night, you would have to use this object, which would be under your bed. It's called a chamber pot. A chamber is another word for a room. So really all it's saying is it's a pot that sits in your room. And a chamber pot would have been pushed underneath the bed if you woke up in the middle of the night, you needed to go for a wee, you'd pull out the chamber pot, you'd wee in the pot, and then you'd just push it back under your bed, go back to bed again. But in the morning, you would have to deal with that. You, or if you had a maid, maybe you could hand it over to somebody else, but somebody would have to empty it. It's not going to flush away. And so what people would often do is just throw it out the window into the street below. So if you heard someone shout, watch out below or guard below, you move pretty quickly because you know that the contents of this chamber pot are going to end up on your head in a minute if you don't move pretty sharpish. So there we have our chamber pot in this bedroom too. We've got a couple of pots under the bed there as well. It can't have been very hygienic or clean because if you got up in the night, went to the toilet and shoved it back underneath your bed, you weren't then going to find some water to wash your hands. And people didn't understand the need. They didn't, they didn't know about germs and they hadn't, um, they hadn't formed a theory about germs making people sick. So hand washing was something that people didn't really bother with. Back downstairs again into this room. There would have been a kitchen. Again, there wouldn't have been a sink in the kitchen like this. That would have needed the water. If we open this up, we've got a jug on the side. 
so you might fill up a jug of water if you needed it. To be honest, most people didn't drink water. Water quality was really bad and the water was probably quite dirty and infected and it made people sick. So they might not understand about germs, but they did know that water often made you ill. Most people, including children, drank beer or what they called small beer. Small beer was watered down beer and wine or watered down wine. So everybody was drinking a lot more fermented drinks that didn't make them quite so ill all the time. In our kitchen here we've got a nice shiny oven. Back to the electricity and gas too. There were no ovens like this. Once more we've got a fire, this time with a big pot over the over the fire. If this had been the kitchen belonging to Thomas Farriner, who was the baker, where the um, who owned the bakery where the Great Fire of London began, he had three ovens. And what that would have meant is he had three big fireplaces like this, that then had a big stone across above the fire. And when he lit that in the morning, the stone would get really hot and he could put the bread that he was going to cook on top of the stone and it would cook on the stone. This is where the, we get the expression upper crust. Upper crust is a term that is sometimes used to mean somebody who's very rich. The reason for that is if you cooked bread on a stone like that, the bottom of the loaf would get hard, possibly black and burnt, because it was over the fire, and that wouldn't be very nice to eat. If you were rich, you only ate the top of the loaf, the upper bit of the loaf, the hard bits called the crust, so you only ate the upper crust and threw the nasty burnt bit away. If you were poor, you perhaps wouldn't be quite so fussy, you'd have to eat the whole loaf. But that's where that expression comes from. So there we have our house and our comparisons between the two houses. Children often ask me about toys in 1666 and what children played with, which is a very good question. There have been toys found, little, little, iron, little iron figures or there would have been wooden toys, but a lot of children wouldn't have had the time to play in the same way that children do now, hopefully, because children would have started working a lot younger. So if you do your own version of the house, which is what we're going to talk about in a minute, you might want to put toys in your modern house. And whilst there might have been little toys in the old house, there wouldn't have been anything like as many probably as we have now. You might be wondering how we know so much about what kind of objects were in a house in the 17th century. And that's where these kind of documents come in handy. These are inventories, which are lists of all the objects that were inside the property for the purpose of valuing them and saying how much they were worth. And these particular inventories are from Kew, from the National Archives in London. So, how can you make your own version of this house? I mentioned before that Sam has done these drawings and we've put them up on our website, on the website which is www.readingriddle.co. UK. And this is what they look like. So there's two black and white pictures. One is of the house in 1666 and one is of the modern house, house now. So what you can do is you can go to our website, print these off, and then when you've done that, colour the pictures in. And once you've coloured the pictures in, you're going to take the new house and you're going to cut the flaps. Now I've cut 
lots of little flaps in these rooms because I wanted to show you little bits of the room at a time but I suggest what you do is each room you make one big flap like these two top rooms and as you can see what I've done is I've cut around the edge along the top down the middle and along the side to make this flap leave this side still attached and then you can bend it back like that so you're going to do that on that room on that room the other bedroom at the top and the living room then what you need to do is you need to make a flap around the car so that you can lift that up and around the roof along the bottom of the roof and up the sides leave yourself a nice thick piece at the top so that when you're making that flap it doesn't rip easily you want to go right to the top of the chimney so that you can lift that up so you're going to do that to the modern house you're going to make your flaps around these rooms and then what you do is you stick you line these two up and you stick down the middle put some glue along the middle of the lower house of the old house glue along here glue around the edges here and you stick this house exactly over the two sheets match exactly and you stick it right over the top of this one make sure that your flaps are still peeled back so that they don't stick accidentally to the house below and then you will have your own version like this the last thing i'm going to tell you is as well as these there is a blank version there's a version that's just got the outside the edge of the house and the um, where the rooms need to go and that means that you could draw your own one from scratch so you could you've got the actual outline and the shape but if you want to make this house look like yours you could draw your own bedroom and your parents room and your different rooms onto this version and make your own copy because I'll tell you a secret Sam has drawn this but it does look rather like our house there's bits of it that I look at and think look very like our house with one big difference it's much tidier in this picture here I hope you've learnt a few facts about the houses back in 1666 and I'm going to leave you with one thought Having seen what a house in 1666 looked like and what they had and didn't have and thinking about what we have in our own houses, which one would you rather live in? Would you rather live now or would you have rather lived over 350 years ago in, in Stuart, London? I hope you enjoy making your own house please send me pictures if you want to send me any pictures on social media or through the reading riddle email and you can find all of that information on our website thank you and goodbye